here so that oh no it doesn't allow it allows a recording to the cloud okay all right Talking bad speed. I see I some think, of Ivana, I think. Yes. I okay, I think we're going to get started with our session today. Uh, yes. Today's, you could uh, mute your mics for now. That would be good. Uh, my name is Mark Spooner, and, and today's session is looking at democratic backsliding, uh, America's war on academic freedom and critical qualitative research. Today on our panel, I'll be we're joined with uh, Kakali Bhattacharya and Ivana Lincoln, and uh, two people couldn't make it. Uh, Brian Keith Alexander and Patrick Lewis were also meant to be part of the panel, but due to scheduling conflicts, uh, won't be present today. The session is recorded, just so you know, and hopefully we'll be able to find the link to that later. Um, we're going to take a pretty informal approach to looking at this issue. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And uh, like I said, if you could keep your mic muted, that would be great. So. I wanted to say, uh, first of all, that it's such an honor to be with uh, Kakali and Ivana. Uh, there's, this is one of Kakali's books right here, uh, Civility, Free Speech and Academic Freedom in Higher Education, Faculty on the Margins by Rutledge. And of course, uh, people will know Ivana Lincoln by lots of her prolific work and also the Sage Handbooks of Qualitative Research. The fifth one's here, and the sixth one is uh, imminent. So globally, what we've been finding across the world is, is a time of a democratic recession. So the optimism that the world felt from the late 70s for that 30 through three decades march where it looked like democracy was inevitably spreading throughout the world is now actually for the past 16 years, we've been in a, in a time of democratic recession where liberal democracies of various kinds have now been receding towards illiberalism and even authoritarianism. And uh, one of the things that I've been uh, looking at and others as well is um, mm -hmm. looking at the university as a pillar of democracy. We often, when you ask someone about uh, what uh, institutions in society do they find are the main pillars of a democracy? Invariably, people will mention the free press, uh, the judiciary, and the legislature, but less often mentioned is the academy. And yet the academy plays a vital role in our democratic process and in keeping uh, checks and balances on government and in also in uh, modeling and creating arenas where uh, democratic citizenship skills and habits of mind can be practiced and honed. So uh, it, it's quite important that the academy be able to function uh, as it ought to in a society if we want to uphold our democratic principles and keep democracy rolling. In my previous work, I, I've looked at neoliberalism, new public management and audit culture, or what I call the triple crisis of market managerialism and measurement and its effects on academic freedom and methodological imagination and possibility. But increasingly, I'm finding that I'm looking at academic freedom and its reciprocal relationship and importance to democracy itself. And frankly, I'm scared. Uh, what I see happening in the United States right now, one of the so, you know, global stalwarts of, of democracy is frightening to me. And uh, I think it's an important reminder that democracy is a fragile and vulnerable ideal, and it requires maintenance, participation, vigilance, and constant reassertion. And it's, if it's left unattended, it can drift or be pushed 
push towards illiberalism and ultimately authoritarianism. And so I always kind of intuitively felt that, but I, I haven't really taken the time to watch what's happening in currently happening right right now, right before our eyes. So um, that's what's got me scared uh, in a healthy democracy if not always respected, academic freedom is at least tolerated and protected. And we understand that with academic freedom, uh, it may be invoked to inform, to disrupt, or to act as a counter check on the very governments, structures, institutions, and cultures that are asked to support and defend it. And, and uh, there's a parallel between the and, and this is the uh, always uh, the academy and its aspirational ideals. So uh, I'm thinking of tenured faculty members, essentially, uh, where in parallel with the judiciary, we're, we're appointed, but uh, you know we're appointed with the professional responsibility to the public itself, and not those who have appointed us. And yet, when you look around, we're in a global democratic recession. When we think about repressive times in terms of uh, academic freedom, we think about perhaps the Red Scare, uh, where they rooted, you know, we're looking to root out communism, and then later on McCarthy and McCarthyism, which, uh, you know, who attempted to round up individuals who they thought had. Um, any dealings or affiliations with communism or even sympathies towards communist ideals. But since 9-11 and the Patriot Act, what we've had is attempts to curtail entire areas of study. So uh, when you look at um, after the Patriot Act, um, under close scrutiny were uh, areas of Middle Eastern studies and pretty much anything that looked at Edward Said. Uh, but those attempts failed. So they, they attempted to, to uh, defund and even set up uh, committees to look at curriculum and what was being taught and, and looking for balance. And yet now, in our current times, we have, uh, I think, 52 pieces of legislation in 30 some states looking to curtail or ban critical race theory in name or in spirit. And uh, some of those bans extend out of K-12 and into post-secondary. And so there again, here we have um, attempts by governments in so-called liberal democracies in the United States of America looking to sort of ban, curtail, shame entire areas of research and study. In this case, I'm thinking of, you know, specifically of critical race theory, some of the legislation uh, that's already been passed and uh, names it, uh, for instance, uh, there's uh, Indiana, Oklahoma, and um, Iowa, I think, have, have banned critical race theory in one form or another. And to be clear, when I'm thinking about critical race theory, I go with Professor Crenshaw, uh, basically in its simplest form. Uh, it's a way of seeing, attending to, and accounting for tracing and analyzing the ways that race is produced, the ways that racial inequality is facilitated, and the ways that our history has created these inequalities that can now be almost effortlessly reproduced unless we attend to the existence of these uh, so-called, these said inequalities. So uh, that's one of the ways I think we have to pay particular attention to what's happening across the United States in the wave of these critical race theory bans. And then also, um, Florida and Indiana have gone further in, and are looking at tests of diversity, which um, my colleagues in Florida would know more about, but I think you, many of you have been sent a survey already with questions uh, for you and students asking them to uh, judge the uh, political bent of their professors, whether they feel they're uh, uh, you, you know, well, I have the exact questions here. Uh, my professors or course instructors are generally more and provides four answers, conservative, liberal, other, or don't know. And, and so um, these developments are very alarming when we think about academic freedom 
in terms of its important responsibility towards democratic ideals and, and living in a democracy. And I, th I think with that, I'll stop talking. That just kind of sets up the context of what I'm looking for, you know, what this panel's somewhat looking for. And uh, I'm curious to hear with what my other panelists would like to add. And then I thought we could have a conversation amongst each other and keep it pretty informal in terms of where we want to go with the conversation. So I, I, I turn it over to you, Kakali, and, and Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming as well. I know that we're doing ICQI differently, and it's not face-to-face, -face, and you are still here, so I, I value you for coming here. Um, so I am in Florida, and at this point, what I will say that is good about Florida is the weather, um, although summer is coming. So other than that, I don't have a whole lot of nice things to say about Florida right now. Um, about a year ago, they, um, DeSantis passed a policy that said that any programs that have critical or race in its name um, at university programs, post-secondary programs, will not be approved at the government level. So my colleague Chris, Chris Busey, who was hired for his work in CRT and CRT pedagogy, CRT research methods, he was creating a graduate certificate in that, and so obviously that was told that that was given um, a red light at this point with no support from anyone. Um, I was creating a critical and decolonial qualitative research graduate certificate program. I was told to not name it that, you know, to just take that out of the naming of it. Um, for me, it was it, it was obviously very, very alarming, you know, but for my colleague, Dr. Busey, it was more so because he was literally hired for his CRT skills. You know, um, I could call my certificate something else because I know more words than DeSantis does, you know, and still do the work of justice or the work of criticality. But the the idea of censoring us, not just through through certain language, but the idea of censoring, sharing, you know, facts and sharing um how whiteness is pervasive and and is embedded in all of our structures that's the part that's really alarming because if you come for this i can i can zig and i can zag and i can do some wiggle, wiggling but then what else are you coming for after this so what has also happened alongside of all of this is florida has uh has don't say gay bill that they have passed um, they have another one right now that was shared with us and that got a lot of really bad rep is an HB7, um, which is where we, the instructors, have been told to, you know, censor ourselves when we teach about race, especially race. And it's essentially the way it has been languaged. It's like you cannot make any white people feel uncomfortable about their race, you know. So then if you discuss things about whiteness, if you discuss things about certain history, certain contemporary realities, and somebody feels bad about it, apparently you're violating the, the statute. Um, so that makes it difficult. And then they also have students who can also report us, um, and they can also record us, and they can report us as well. Um, so it's been really hard. It's been super challenging. My colleague eventually won. He he took his uh, Dr. Busey he took his case to union. Thank God, like University of Florida, where I work, we are unionized and it's a solid union. Um, so the union fought with him, and he did uh, get to pass his program, which was a big W on the corner, given that it's Florida, you know. But it's not just this. We also have. Uh, very draconian post tenure review uh, mandate coming down the pipeline to discipline us further, you know, for any of us who can wig wiggle away and zig and zag, which we all know how to do. Um, these post tenure reviews are coming up. Georgia already is walking towards, you know, abolishing tenure and Florida is following, following suit to do this um, as well. And so these, even though we have all, we already have, um, you know, um, 
a lot of um, annual reviews and um, merit reviews and everything. So we are reviewing ourselves every year, but these post tenure review is, is coming down the pipeline as another disciplinary device. So then if you are multiply minoritized and you're doing justice oriented work, that becomes a way to use that and, and weaponize it against you. Also in the neoliberal academy, there is a big push for getting grants for justice oriented critical qual don't have a lot of places where you can go for grant money for that you know there are a few places and it's super competitive so you can go to a spencer but it's super competitive for very little money and it doesn't bring in a lot of indirect cost to the university so the university now stands poised to start a termination process on tenured professor by using very um very unjust processes you know and it's unjust because it's intersectional oppression so um i'm not sure what is democratic anymore it feels like a very performative word just like just like dei is has become a performative move and in a state like florida i don't even know like i i get called to to be part of dei conversations and it feels dirty to me because i feel like i'm i'm just uh, being invited to being tokenized because if you really wanted to do the DEI work in alongside democracy, you'd have to change the entire system. The system right now as it is is so rotten it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It only works for one group of people. It doesn't work for everybody else. Um, it's not equitable. Are we are we willing to have that conversation? Is is social growth possible? You know, and social equity possible within a post secondary university structure? Are we really willing to have that conversation? Because then we have to talk about, you know, whose backs have we used to build this structure upon? Whose lands are we occupying to build this structure? You know, whose history have we erased? Who who do we center and normalize? And so that's that's where it stands right now. Everything is in a very um, alarming zone, at least for where I am working. And it question it makes us question like. How long do we go this way, you know, and what does resistance need to look like and how do we collectively organize a resistance beyond our own individual institutions. So i'll stop there. I just uh, going to send Ivana the uh, session ID and and to that. Um, I, I thought it. it it might be good to just add the definition of academic freedom. I forgot to do that in my initial presentation, but essentially academic freedom hasn't changed uh, since 1915, really, when it's, a, you know, in its barest, simplest form, it's a freedom of inquiry and research, freedom of teaching within the university or college, and freedom of extramural utterances and actions. And, and so, um, and the, the other piece I wanted to add to what uh, Cockley has said is the um, if we think about the time of McCarthy and the communist scares as the red scare, we might think of this time as the white scared. Uh, that's what uh, I've started to name it: the white scare with the e with the d in in a pot in a parentheses, the white scared. And I think that that characterizes what is happening right now. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that while I send. Ivana is here, I think. She she is in. Yeah, she's in session host. Hi, Ivana. Oh, there we go. Excellent. If you're looking for unmute, it's the bottom left. Just asked her to unmute. See if that works. There we go. Hi, Ivana. Hi, I, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I can't hear you. We've both uh, spoken, if you can hear me now, I'm not sure. Uh, 
So it's my understanding you, you can't hear us right now, Ivana? Doesn't sound like she can hear us. Yeah. I wonder we if, can hear her. I'll type. I wonder if she'll see us. We... Oh, I know what I can do. You can hear me, right, Mark? Yes, yeah, I can hear you clear, clearly. Oh, um, I think you're muted. Oh, you can't. Unmute. Now, can you hear me? Perfect. You can hear me. Okay. Why don't I just go ahead and speak to everyone? I can't hear you, but apparently you can hear me. Is that okay, Mark? Okay. Um, I I think um, we're still talking about attacks on academic freedom. And uh, this is reminiscent of something over a hundred years ago when Mrs. Stanford had a faculty member um, fired because she didn't like his political views uh, at Leland Stanford University, which she and her husband had funded. And uh, we had no history of academic freedom then. And so her firing of the faculty members stood. Uh, and it, it seems we've come full circle again. Uh, we're getting faculty with the threat of firing if they don't agree to certain kinds of teaching restrictions, particularly uh, not teaching about critical race theory and not teaching a number of other things that uh, are guaranteed by academic freedom. And it seems to me that the attacks on academic freedom, coupled with the attacks on tenure and the gradual reduction of the tenured faculty by virtue of hiring contingent faculty, uh, it really has two purposes. And the first is the uh, right wing's attempt to uh, gain control of powerful institutions and institutions of higher education, particularly state and well-funded private institutions are, um, are on the chopping block. Okay, they are, uh, they are targets, if you will, for uh, right wing can't. The second uh, purpose that such attacks have, I think, is coercing control of, the, of faculty independence, right? Uh, uh, permitting uh, faculty to only go so far and then to abridge academic freedom. Because by, in doing so, what we end up doing is in fact uh, controlling uh, faculty curriculum, what they are allowed to teach and therefore controlling students' minds, okay? Particularly, I see this as, an, as a continue, part of a continuing attack on the effort to spread critical thinking, right? The right wing doesn't want a whole lot of critical thinking going around. Now, I'm not much for conspiracy theories. Uh, I'm the sort of person who thinks that uh, mostly the federal government and the right wing would screw up a two car funeral. Uh, but I think that we have to, I think that we have to pay attention because right now the efforts to, to control academic freedom, control tenure uh, are disorganized. They are sort of in a patchwork phase. But I think that we're going to find that sooner or later there are coalitions made that attempt to put some um, reins and bridles on, on the faculty machine, okay? I, I think that there are some things that we can do to fight this. 
And it seems to me like the first thing that we can do is uh, we have to nice. Now I'm in a right to work state. So that means that we probably can't unionize, but it does mean that we need to be talking to our faculty colleagues about things like joining AAUP. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you have anything similar to AAUP in Canada, but, uh, but it is an organization of faculty that uh, look very critically at what's happening on a wide variety of fronts in the higher education, uh, C-A-U-T. Okay, from Mark Spooner to everyone. Okay, uh, the Canadian Union of, the Canadian Association of University Subteachers. Okay, uh, I, I am a member of AAUP and have been for a long time, but I have to say, that I find uh, an enormous amount of difficulty uh, trying uh, very hard to get my hard science colleagues interested. I have less difficulty with my education colleagues or my liberal arts college colleagues. Um, but it seems to me that the, that the stronger representation we have, the more likely it is that what we're going to have is a united voice against some of these state laws and regulations. And it will be more difficult to impose such legislation on faculty than it is on classroom teachers, as it has been in the state of Texas. The second thing that it seems that we can do is to make our voices heard in state departments, particularly those of us at state funded institutions. Uh, when the legislature is considering such legislation that will restrict academic freedom and therefore democracy at you the higher ed the level, up, I think you that we have a choice to go and make some, um, make some statements to the legislature. We could get signed on for any kind of, of uh, uh, testimony that we wish, so long as it's civil. And we ought to be addressing these things rather than simply letting, uh, uh, letting it happen to us, okay? We need to provide a united front and a spokesperson against such legislation in the states. Um, I do think that if we lose uh, seats in the next round of elections coming up in November, that we will have a somewhat harder time if we are not, uh, uh, if we are not on it, if we are not organized. And so it's to our own uh, benefit that we speak with our colleagues that we make pleas to get organized and get organized under a um, under a single umbrella, which would be for us in Texas AAUP, since there is no union uh, probably allowed in Texas under right to work laws. Now this is going to take some push for people in states like mine that have right to work laws. But I think that we have to uh, make the, the argument that, that this affects all of us and it will continue to affect even the hard sciences if we are not careful in our guardianship. And that's all I wanted to say for now, uh, Mark. Uh, does anybody have any comments about that? Mark, Kakali? I can't hear you, but... <laughs> You know, I'd be pleased to have comments. Kokali? Yeah. Well, Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> um, Ivana, can you hear me? No. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll share um, absolutely in agreement with everything Ivana said. My co-editor for the book, Rashmi Dat Balastad, a few few weeks ago, um, 
was in in national news because she had posted something on her personal Facebook page about, you know, how English majors are awesome. And there was some some note posted in a classroom in an English building. Um, well, it was supposed to be English building, but the engineering and the business people had taken over. No, sorry, the business people had taken over that building. So she was talking about the, the CEO of Disney, who was uh, who's an English major, but she said something to the effect of like, he was an English major, but then he lost his soul when he went to become the CEO of Disney or something like that. Well, she immediately got a letter from her human resources saying that um, there has been complaints made about her um, for creating hostile work environment. Um, and that was something she made her comment in a personal Facebook page. So uh, it, uh, she works in a private liberal arts college. So of course there was no union over there. So what we had to do was we had to trigger a lot of national organizations to come through. So we triggered FIRE, we triggered AUP. Um, she had to get a lawyer. She's a woman of color. And um, we created a petition and there was over like immediately overnight, we had at least 150 signatures. And so we had to collectively gather and push back and they then they changed their stories and they said, no, this is a continuous pattern. They won't tell her exactly what she was being charged against. And so after enormous amount of pushback where they're not even telling you what you're investigating, what is it that is getting investigated about you? as well as like her First Amendment rights being violated. Eventually they dropped it, you know, but it takes so much, so much labor, so much organization, so much time, so much energy investment just to put up a resistance when there is a no, no you know, defined structure of resistance because even resistance is um, under, you know, the boundary of of these master narratives, what is legal, what is illegal, even when you want to protest or create resistance, there's a boundary, bounded system within which you can do this. And if you do not do this and do this other thing, then, you know, folks come after you. And then there's always the hidden curriculum. So the job may be, for now, my colleague's job may be secure, but now there is a hidden curriculum that creates a very hostile environment so that it would promote a decision for her to make to leave because after a while everybody reaches a threshold of enough so yes i think that if we are not unionized we have to have um, some collective way of creating structures of resistance so that it 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 bounces and and acts immediately when some of these um absurd which is some some of the absurd stuff that i said in my keynote some of this absurd forms of oppression pop up for really no reason you know, the reason it is that there is a fear of losing power um, and having the power of whiteness be disrupted. Yeah, I think that that's uh, definitely it right there, the backlash of white power. Um, I, I wanted to read a warning to you, a caution, and then I thought we could uh, take more questions from, from the group and maybe at the end focus on some uh, areas of action or, or hopeful areas uh, that, that we could, uh, steps we could take to try to um, create a counter, a counter piece to what's happening across the United States and across the world globally. Uh, one, the caveat I wanted to, that I think about is uh, Tim Timothy Schneider's uh, institutions don't protect themselves. And, um, and I'll read one quotation from Levetsky and Zablat that I think really sums it up. Uh, Institutions alone are not enough to reign in elected autocrats. Constitutions must be defended by political parties and organized citizens, but also by democratic norms. Without robust norms, constitutional checks and balances do not serve as the bulwarks of democracy we imagine them to be. Institutions become political weapons wielded forcefully by those who control them against those who do not. This is how elected autocrats subvert democracy, packing and weaponizing the courts and other neutral agencies, buying off the media and the private sector, 
or bullying them into silence and rewriting the rules of politics to tilt the playing field against opponents. The tragic paradox of this electoral route to authoritarianism is that democracy's assassins use the very institutions of democracy gradually, subtly, and even legally to kill it. And with that, uh, I'd love to open it up to the room and, and continue this conversation. Yes, BB. Hello, hi, Kelly. How are you? Nice to see you, Kelly. I think I got that right. No, it's Kakuli, actually. Kakuli. Yeah. Did I get it right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you were speaking to tokenism, I was going back to what is happening in Canada. Um, as And I worked as a director for an English language center in Canada. And you see how um, diverse populations or people of color are being put in these positions just as a placeholder, so to speak, to fill a percentage gap um, that they need 1% of BIPOC to be in that, in that position so that they can maintain funding. And, and when you actually do the job that they've asked you and they've welcomed you there to do, then you get into trouble for doing it. And it is a very, very um, precarious situation. I, I had to make a choice. It's either my soul or I, I, I just literally slowly die a slow death here because you um, teaching and even though it was a director position, it was a teaching position. Teaching is a moral profession. And we have to go home at night and sleep. And that was that was my goal. And a lot of um, people that come to the Center for English Language Training are immigrants. And how can you work in and teach in a center and not be culturally responsive to the students in your classroom? As simple as that. So um, what, what we're discussing here resonates so much with um, institutions in Canada and, and what is happening. And now I'm in a different context um, where white is not, and I'm stretching here for us to see that th this, this problem is like, uh, it, it's mind boggling sometimes for me. Um, we, where I am situated right now, white is not the dominant culture. But how that seeps, that kind of ideology seeps into us and we internalize it, that we do not see the harm we inflict on each other. So that that kind of dynamics um, at play. And um, yes, union and, and, and all that, but I think it is, it's, it's like a, a whole, how do you shift a system? Right, it's it's the question. How do you shift? Because it's the system, and the and then the people that are within the system have to have the will, the political will to shift it. But then that's a risk, right? We are talking about bread and butter on our tables sometimes. So um, so I resonate with globally. I've traveled. I've I've done research in in a lot of places and teaching. And I've seen how this this play out, and I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I really don't. I try to navigate the space that I'm in, and learn, and listen more than talking. Um, so uh, that's that's just where my headspace is as as we we're talking about this. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if anyone wants to respond. And. If not, we can move on to other comments and, and questions as well. I'll respond a little bit. I think that, you know, um, the university, the system, as, as you were saying, it co-ops all of us. We all have our boundaries um, of how much resistance we're going to do, because, I mean, there's a, there's a whole um, spectrum of different types of resistance, and it can get riskier and more dangerous, and we calibrate that with our you know, certain other things like 
being able to pay our bills and having a roof over our head and and all of that so it, it by nature it co-ops us anyway a few years ago i wrote an article called the vulnerable academic kind of playing off of ruth behar's the vulnerable observer and i sort of thought about the system as being in the system as being the same as um, being in a boat um, from life of pi where you were in a boat with a tiger you know and your survival depends on feeding the tiger fish and i feel like that's kind of the work that we are doing we straddle we've tried to figure out how to feed the tiger fish so that we don't become dinner while we're still looking for land and freedom simultaneously so of course it becomes messy these lines become bound really blurry and who can do what resistance and resistance is not even the same you know and not not even all all folks that are differently marginalized and minoritized see resistance the same way either you know so it becomes super difficult and so then we have to come together on some at least some interest convergence on collective will you know if if we do this work it has to be something that we agree on and we a lot of us agree on a lot of the same things too i mean we agree on equity we agree on disrupting anti-blackness we agree on challenging heteronormative stuff and and most of us want to preserve an academic freedom but that just seems like a very illusionary aspect. I don't think we have academic freedom, let alone preserve it. I mean, depending on locations that you are operating from, we don't always have academic freedom, you know, and I sit in different uh, dissertation, outstanding dissertation reviews, and I see dissertations coming from scholars of color, graduate students of color, and I see that they want to do these sorts of brave work but they're bounded by the system to play by the rule and a lot of times like then folks who have more intellectual freedom also have different type of social capital that then they can do these very experimental work and then we reward that and so i just i i think that even academic freedom or preserving academic freedom is one that we need to question because we don't all have the same academic freedom um, even though we all want to experience it and preserve it. I'll stop, Tanya. I guess uh, I just really wanted to thank you so much, Cockley, for your post. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I wanted to share um, just just a very, very new experience. And, um, and I think the best way to summarize it is, I guess I'm needing some support and, and guidance, if you will, about how to navigate through um, when I, I've come to a place where I realized that the people who I thought were allies, we have different definitions of what equity is. And I feel like in, in my landscape, and my landscape is you know K-12, I'm a practitioner, that um, I, I, we ventured in on this, this strong equity work on our campus, but I see that the people who I thought were, were co-conspirators, co-conspirators and allies, like your buck stopped and I was still running. And, and how do we regroup when you now are using, you're, you're weaponizing your whiteness that I thought that you had done some work around. And I, I, I just really am actually baffled when I, I, thought, I thought the work had been done until you started crying and you started weaponizing your tears. I'm like, wait, wait, we don't do that. I thought we said we don't do that. And, and it's being weaponized against another black teacher on my campus. So I'm, I'm really, I'm just, I'm really struggling in trying to, how do I salvage the work? And yeah, how do I salvage the work? And this may not even be appropriate for this, this, this panel, you know, but I just really wanted to throw that out there. No, I'm glad you did. I'm super glad you did. Um, I think like some of the ways we have been thinking about DEI and and I have begun to loathe this word wokeness. I've really begun to loathe this word because people have a sense of like, oh, she's woke or he's woke or they're woke to to kind of mark an arrival, you know, when when the work is always developmental. And I find like, you know, when I have when I live, I've lived in red states more than I've lived in blue states and in the US. So at least in the red states, the folks that are hateful 
you know, overtly, I know what their agenda is. I know where I stand with them. You know, I know what they're going to do with my work. I know that they could come into a Zoom meeting and say, shut the fuck up when Dr. Lincoln is talking. And I know what, where all of that stands, you know, I know that I can handle that. The trickier and the deeper cuts are the ones that position themselves as ally, but think that their work is done or that, um, or that they're so woke that there is no more to be done because they are not actively going and hating someone. Therefore, that's it. You know, I'm not actively hating someone, but you're benefiting from all the systems of privileges regularly. So the work is ongoing. The interrogation is ongoing, you know, for all of us, I've, even for those of us who are multiply minoritized, because we internalize a lot of this oppressive narratives and normalize it, which is part of the reason I said in my keynote that we make to, need to make that absurd, what we have normalized, you know. So I agree with you that you know that it is it is a very challenging uh, landscape to navigate when folks are unlearning stuff and also feeling complacent about how much work they have already done to unlearn some of that stuff and it creates deep cuts when you open up and want to have a trusted relationship so, so that you can do the work together and and that's very very difficult i don't have any answer i'm just you know supporting your perspective and resonating and offering some of my thoughts but it's it's often a very deep cut for me too well, and i also wonder Cockley, like how can we do this work and healing not even be in the equation exactly and you know and, that that's my perspective i always talk about healing i've always talked about yeah. the resistance work needs to come with healing after we break things apart we need to put ourselves together and so the resistance mm -hmm. has to have a healing component as you know in academia we're really good at putting out critiques and oppositional arguments and we have a hammer and we know how to break stuff down but what are we building in its place and are we incorporating healing because sometimes we would just change characters you know we would mm -hmm. be like okay let's just let's just make leadership look like this let's have more faculty of color but unless you are changing the dynamics of how we go about doing this work every day, the power reconfiguration, you know, mm -hmm. what we center, self-care, compassion, healing, wholeness oriented way of handling, working with people, you know, mm -hmm. we're just replicating the same structure and just changing characters essentially. So I don't know that that does mm -hmm. anything. And I see some of the DEI initiatives follow, following in that, in that algorithm essentially. No, I think you just, I think you just gave me language, Cockley, for what I was struggling with, because it, it just, that seemed absurd to me that you can, a person, I, I developed this whole equity team on my campus, but if you are making a conscious decision to say, we can never be unified, I'm sorry, when you make a conscious decision to say, we're ne we can never be unified, then you can't do this work or you're not ready yet to do this work because you're going to cause more harm when you don't have an approach that is restorative because we have to decenter something, but something else has to be centered. And, and I think maybe that's our next step is the conversation of, so what are we going to center now? We know we don't want this, but if we say we'll never be whole, those are, that's pretty strong language. And, and maybe we need to sit down and sit this team down for a minute until we figure that out. Thank you, Cogley, I appreciate that. Are there other comments or questions that people wanna raise? It's, it is unmuted. No, you're on mute. I can I see, see your, your microphone. microphone. Dr. Lincoln Dr. wants to add something. She just needs to unmute her microphone. Okay. Now. There you go. There I go. You can hear me now? You can hear me now? Okay. I, I have to admit that I have some trouble when when we start making judgments like so and so is it ready to do this work or or you know they they are running around seeming to be woke but they aren't really woke i think we have to be careful that we don't uh that we don't rush to judgment because it seems to me that woke is on a continuum and that what we are looking at 
is various stages of actualization and realization as people come to the understanding and the knowledge of what it is we're confronting when we think about uh, racism and how it plays out on our campuses and how it plays out in our classroom. I don't think that that relieves us of the responsibility, particularly now before the, the radical right has really uh, coalesced around a series or around a program of a series of actions. I think we need to keep doing what we are doing, but I think that we need to be very careful about passing judgment on where people might be along the continuum. And I think that we have to keep making um, allies wherever we can. And, and in all love, if somebody is creating a situation which is hostile or which is not wholesome or not healthful, then I think we need to, to talk with those people. I think we need to approach our colleagues in a, I guess, in a spirit of, of true alliance uh, and, and true compassion and talk to those people. Now, that doesn't mean that we're gonna change hearts and minds overnight, but it does mean that we get out of the blame business and that, and that what we try to do is move people along that continuum of wokeness or whatever you wanna call it. I'm sorry that the radical right has captured the term woke because I think that it communicates um, a, a level of awareness that, that we do need to be talking about. Um, but, but I think at the moment that what we need to do is to keep trying um, to make those connections, to talk with people, to, to try to help people to see what it is that we're trying to do and to help others to understand where we are that we understand where we are, we understand the work that needs to be done on ourselves and to help them see that there may be work that needs to be done on their part. I, I'm really, um, now that doesn't mean I don't think that there are hostile people out there. That doesn't mean that I don't think that there are people who are uh, overtly or covertly racist but it does mean that I think that we need to stay in compassionate communication with people to, to try to help them see their way to move along the continuum. I, I don't know, and maybe you all disagree with me, but that's kind of where I am, is I really feel like there's a need to communicate and to keep communicating. Right now, academic freedom means really nobody's on our case. Uh, and, and we can go on putting a roof over our head uh, and, and uh, keeping coffee in the cupboard to make for in the morning for as long as we like uh, un until the right gets more organized. So I think we ought to use this opportunity to set up as many lines of communication as we can. Um, I don't know, that's, that's just me. Mark, you might wanna say something about my naivete. <laughs> no, I, that's all. I, I don't have a, a lot to add and I've, I've learned sometimes it's uh, best to listen. <laughs> and I think I'll, I'll take that position at, at this time, uh, but I will act as a chair and I, there is, I, well, Kakali maybe wants to add something. And then uh, uh, in my order of <laughs> hands raised, uh, I've, I've seen uh, uh, Tanya and then Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, so, so as the chair, I'm just keeping order. So uh, I'll, I'll mute. 
Yeah, I want to okay. add something, but I'd rather have Tanya and Caroline speak first. Is that freaking a lot? Audio so, on my phone, um, so. so I'm just gonna have Tanya go and then Caroline go, and then I might chime back in after they after this. Thank you. Thank you. I think someone has to mute. Okay. Are we good? It's, it's We're good? probably Ivana. There. Okay. So I think I think my um, my response to that is that becomes it's, I wish it were that simple um, because I think as a as a black woman in a leadership position, uh, you know, who happens to have a PhD in K twelve, that's really it's a little bit more complicated then I think to just go back and keep educating and keep educating because that's already been our history that I do the teaching and held responsible for the teaching and educating. But I do believe communication is still important, but um, you know, I don't want to keep you know, carrying, carrying the load. And, and I think when I, when I spoke about maybe a person needs to, isn't uh, ready, I think as a leader of that school, I'm, I'm thinking about I can't, how I have to protect everyone or in this position of protection that I can't allow you to, I can't allow anyone to do more harm and I'm aware of it. And if I know that, you know, different things are being weaponized, then I need to shut it down until we do have a conversation or until something is different. Um, <clears throat> I don't wanna be, I don't want this equity team who has done some really great work to, uh, to be then, um, not received well or a lot of assertions being made about this equity team because a person on the equity team is acting in a way that is inequitable and so that to me I think that's my responsibility I, I do really have very much a shepherd's lens um you know and it's or pastoral whatever you want to call it that's that's the lens that I have and so I'm thinking about all the sheep and I don't I'm not going to let one sheep be slaughtered for somebody who's standing up on a DEI soapbox when you're actually slinging the the weapons that you don't want people to sling at you um yeah so i you know i i totally respect you know your perspective and i don't want communication to be shut down but i also don't want to own training anybody because i think that's a self-work and that's a self-commitment that you have to make and my job is to make sure that all my sheep are safe are safe that was a tongue twister that all my sheep are can continue to live and to me that it, it just becomes an, it also, it becomes an oxymoron if you're standing up there as an equity person, yet you have decided that there is no healing because this person happens to disagree on the lines of, of queerness. And, and so to me, that showed me that you go, your equity goes there and then it stops. Because then when you turn around and cry and you think that the crying is going to get something and this black woman says, keep your tears because I'm, I'm not phased by your tears. It just becomes this other thing. So that that I've just explained to you why I did that, why I said we're going to shut this down right here in this moment so I can protect the rest of the sheep. So I hope I hope that makes sense. Cockley, you want to chime? Um, I will. Um, I want Caroline to go before me and then I'll share some thoughts. Um, something that um well, first of all, let me say that I'm at Rutgers University, and, I, and when I got here about 15 years ago, I found it to be the most colonial campus I'd ever been on, and I've been at a lot of universities, and so, but, but, and so what happened was uh, a few years ago, I had severe violations of my academic freedom and uh, was removed from teaching and had to file a grievance with the union. And then was assured nothing like that would ever happen again. And then it happened again under a different person and removed a couple of times from teaching and had to file another grievance. And, and what I would say is the advice that I got from the union was stellar. The advice I got from colleagues was horrific. And this is an area where we need to do an incredible amount of work. One, people are talking about the way they're being bullied and mistreated on their campuses, so we don't even know what's happening. And two, what happened, what has happened at Rutgers is in this process, I got, I found myself in leadership positions with both the union and with the Senate. 
And now we have a new president at Rutgers. And what troubled me with our new president was the way some people in the union went after our first African-American president before he even had a chance to demonstrate what he was about. He was painted as being the enemy and his conversations about creating beloved community were people attempted to use that against him to make the case for the union. And that became incredibly troubling to me that sometimes we get invested in a position and we lose sight of who are our friends and who are our enemies. And maybe, you know, maybe we make enemies where we don't need to, right? And so my experience with the with this new president is that he has actually spoken out about issues of cognitive dissonance among our students. And that was part of what I got into all this trouble for with students who are having cognitive dissonance. Our new president said, if they're not having cognitive dissonance, we're not getting our job done, right? But under the kind of neoliberal administration we had prior to this president, that was not the case. The student has a complaint. The student is right. People lost sight of due process. They lost sight of communicating with, with, with me or other professors about, well, what they didn't even understand the pedagogy, right? And so the other thing that I wanna to add to the conversation is we also have a new dean in my college and I have never seen a university transform as fast as I've seen this one transform. And one of the things that helped was the union, you know, we, we voted for a strike. Now we didn't actually have to go on strike, but just the, threat of a strike was enough to get the, the former administration to the bargaining table in a real way. I don't want to say that things are perfect, but I do want to say we have a new dean who's also African-American. And all of a sudden, our Department of Urban Education exists. And I mean, it has been invisible, literally, on a campus in Newark, New Jersey, which has been mind boggling. So now new hires, new tenure track lines, new programs. I mean, it's like in an instant, the world shifted. So, so what do I wanna say about that? I don't know. It's just great to be on the other side. That's what I want. Oh, and now my two courses that I was removed from teaching have been approved to be part of the liberal arts curriculum. So, so I guess what I wanna say is, yes, we have to hold fast and we have to be vigilant but we never know when the, when the new possibility will show up. And that's part of what's so, so difficult because I know colleagues who have walked away from tenure track lines because of situations like I've just lived through and hearing their bitterness was part of what allowed me to stay the course. Um, the last thing is I was on a call recently with a professor, a dean in Ukraine. And her commitment to her students and her university was so inspiring that another professor from another part of the world said, how can you be so passionate about your university, right? Given what so many other people are encountering on their universities. And she said, I'm elected to this job by faculty and staff and students. And I about fell off my chair, elected, <laughs> right? I mean, so it's left me like I need to learn a whole lot more about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline. And thank you, Tanya, for saying, sharing your thoughts as well. I'll share that um, I have, you know, uh, many years of doing contemplative work and contemplative practices. So, you know, cultivating good perspective taking and engaging with compassion and empathy you know, are very core to how I interact with people and what I do. And I'll add to that is that because everybody's work on disrupting the understanding of whiteness, colonialism, um, sexuality, and other intersectional forms of, you know, oppression, because that's, that's on a continuum and everybody does that work on a continuum and everybody's located wherever they're located on it, it really falls upon me 
to decide how much energy do I want to invest, you know, in, uh, in engaging, especially if I'm engaging with difference and difficult dialogues, you know, it falls on me in terms of like, what is my capacity and how much energy do I want to invest? So when we're talking about compassion and having a compassion communication, I want to add that that compassion should first be exercise for ourselves. You know, what is the most compassionate way that we can engage in this without draining our own internal resources? Because that drainage is where we have compassion fatigue, we have racial battle fatigue, and we see burnout, we see pe folks, and especially multiply minoritized folks, um, have you know, developed autoimmune diseases and other diseases, stress is a huge factor in insulin resistance and other triggers for other diseases as well. And so this has like a super material effect on bodies that are multiply minoritized and in higher ed and beyond higher ed. So my thinking along this line has been that what is the most compassionate um, way for you to, um, for myself, for myself when i'm working on a on something that is important to me i ask myself is this the amount of energy i want to spend on it and what is the what is the way that i can maintain self-compassion while i'm doing this work so i just want to add to that 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 if that is unless we practice self-compassion um i don't know that we can project a compassionate perspective that is not going to be performative puja um Thank you so much, Kakli, for uh, your insightful conversation. And I agree with Ivana that uh, we need to communicate and uh, we need to be first comp compassionate. I agree with your healing work and we must be compassionate towards ourselves. And we really need a village to do that, to have a community. Like at Indiana University, we formed a feminist research collective, which composed of those who are doing social justice work, um, graduate students, undergraduate students who are interested in social uh, uh, justice work. And we kind of meet every week to co-construct critical thought around love, diversity, social justice, and ethnography. And we check in to share our everyday struggles every week. And we, our check-ins are very unstructured. Sometimes they are 30 minutes. Sometimes we go for 45 minutes, we cry. And this is such a safe space that I can discuss my personal struggles that I have not been able to discuss with my family members, with this group. And we are here to help each other to best of our ability. And we are competing only with, you know, to help each other grow. We write together, undergraduate students write with us, and there is no judgment. There is no pretty drafts or rough drafts, or we just help each other grow. And uh, we are also trying to move away from the established ways of thinking and doing research uh, where we do not consider scholarship to be devoid of love, where our intellectual stimulation is pretty much embedded in love for each other and love for the work that we do. And that that's a space. And I'm not saying this is a perfect space we have created. We are still work in progress. And like, I am an early scholar. I have moved away from Indiana University and I am still a part of it. And we meet for two hours every week. So all I'm trying to say that all that conversation that is happening here, we really need to have a community wherever we are where we can support each other and uh, and look at my own conditioning. And that has helped me to enhance my classroom pedagogy so much because I have been able to look at my biases that I have carried over the years and critically reflected. So yeah, I just wanted to say that this has really helped me uh, professionally and, and so much for the conversation today. I. I have learned so much. Thanks, Pooja. Bibi, Anthelia? Actually, what, what, what you're saying and what Pooja is saying, um, I've seen the, I've witnessed how much um, that language, to find that compassionate language to talk through these issues with, with difference, with people who don't see eye to eye, if for want of a better phrase, I've seen the benefits 
of incorporating contemplative practices into this work and how that has shifted, um, and, and I'm referring here to Canada, and how that has shifted our relationship um, to build a community of practice with our differences to get to that common goal. I've seen it and I continue to see it. Um, we plant seeds and then probably we leave a community, but we stay in touch. So um, just to echo that as much as this is difficult work and this is hard work um, and we might not be uh, finding allies or, or but staying with the work, staying with the work and nourishing ourselves through those very finding practices that works for us internally, that we can sit quietly with ourselves sometimes. Um, it's, it's okay, and it's okay to feel bad sometimes. But what I would like to reiterate is that in these, and I'm air quoting, um, hostile environments sometimes, those practices work. They work, they, they do. It may not happen in a blink of an eye, it may not happen right away for us to witness, but it does. So that that was. Cynthia, did you have your hand raised earlier? Um, um, maybe not. I thought I saw a hand. I, an, another piece that uh, I thought you might be interested in. So it, what's happening in Canada, we're not seeing outright bans on critical race theory and divisive concepts and things like that. The state hasn't approached it in that way. But another way that they're trying to redirect what universities do is, um, is uh, in uh, large, like our largest province, Ontario, uh, we're, the, the universities have been put under performance-based metrics and some of the metrics that uh, determine how much a university will be funded by, uh, how, how much up to 60% of a university's funding from the state will be, are things like how much, how many, res the total amount of research grants we've got, we've received from industry. So they're, you know, pushing us towards industry uh, based corporate research and development. And also on our grads, they're um, looking at what is the income, what are our, our grads making? And uh, also are they getting employment, uh, the time to employment and is the work in a related field? So they're repurposing the, the university as uh, serving the labor market and industry research, which is another more subtle way of, of redirecting what kinds of research scholars engage in and what kinds of teaching we do. And, and of course, there's a whole other aspect of it incentivizing universities away from minoritized students, because we know that in Canada, uh, hiring of new uh, employees is racialized. Uh, uh, minoritized groups are hired with less frequency and for less money. So in a in a strange way, the state is creating an incentive for universities to take on those with the most social capital, with the best chances of succeeding and getting employment at the highest amount of money uh, uh, quickly as possible. So, so these are issues that are happening. And I wasn't sure if in the American context that gets lost about what's happening up north. And I didn't want to position my critique of the United States and, and make it seem like uh, things aren't uh, bad things aren't happening in Canada as well. And so I, I wanted to, to let you know about that. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I'd like to speak unmute, to unmute your, Dr. Lincoln, unmute your um, Zoom mic. Okay, I'll try. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I would like to say, Mark, that this press toward the corporate world and the, the, the needs of labor and industry is not anything new in the US. 
uh, we went through this about uh, before and immediately after the First World War, where the focus was on preparing people to work in industry rather than preparing them for citizenship. If you look at the history of higher ed in the U.S., my field, uh, you, you see that the, the push toward vocationalism comes uh, on, on a regular basis around the, uh, around the circle. Now, I think the difference is now that we have uh, money which is available for research, which we didn't have uh, before and after the First World War. Uh, and, and we have corporations that are um, moving toward monopolism at a, an increasingly swift rate. And we, we have corporations that are bigger actors in the legislative and, uh, and, and lawmaking and uh, fiscal decision arenas. So what we have is amplified, um, I don't know, amplified uh, influence. I'd say influence instead of evil. My first instinct was to say amplified evil. But, uh, but, it, but vocationalism is nothing new in American higher education. And it took us literally until the, uh, the Great Depression to be able to move institutions of higher education back toward the, their role of preparing for citizenship in the United States. So I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not surprised that vocationalism has shown up again because corporations have far more power vis-a-vis -vis institutions of higher education than they ever had before. And they have money to throw at people. It is a nice cop out for the states to be able to say, uh, we don't have any money, but you can get some from Raytheon Corporation, or you can get some from X, Y, or Z Corporation, or you can get some from X, Y, or Z Foundation, which is also funded by a corporation. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. What it does is once again, two things. One, it creates a situation where them that has gets what you were talking about, taking people who already have social capital and ensuring that they continue to have that social capital and more, right? And thereby shutting out minoritized populations. And also it's to, to quote my old mentor, Bob O'Neill, may he rest in peace. It allows the uh, nose of of the corporate camel into the tent of academic freedom. <coughs> because corporations are far more interested in getting the research done that they want and need rather than what has to be done. And so we have the corporate camel who not only has their nose in the corporate tent, but who, um, who is spreading the wealth in a discriminatory way. By discriminatory, I mean the people who are getting it are the engineering and computing people and the business people. It's not liberal arts and it's not teacher education. Um, and, and so we have those two situations which are now coming to a head. But uh, I understand the situation that you're in. We are too, uh, Mark. But this is nothing new for American higher education, for sure. Uh, and I'm not sure what we do about that, but, but it is not new uh, on this campus, particularly since we're a former military school. Uh, we were, all, uh, that's all I'll say. We, we have uh, about four minutes left. If anyone wants to add a comment or a quick question. <laughs> While we're waiting for some of those, maybe I want to say thank you so much to my co-panelists 
and uh, everyone who braved the virtual world and was able to join in on our Zoom conversation. It's a real pleasure. It pales in comparison to being there in Urbana-Champaign, right on the campus, sharing our stories and uh, just being in each other's company and learning from each other in that warm environment. I think uh, I, I really miss it. I need it. I want to go back. Uh, hopefully next year I'll see all of you and we can bump into each other in the hallway and have some wonderful, enriching and supportive conversations and, and maybe uh, head to Murphy's. Uh, exactly. We can walk up the street and, and enjoy uh, an iced tea or a, a Guinness, as I might prefer, and, and uh, continue the conversation. I, I turn over to my two hosts, I guess, my, my co-panelists, and uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor. Yeah, I'm so glad that we did this. And thank you for everyone for being here and engaging in the conversation. I just wish we could go to Murphy's after this and have more geeky conversations and, you know, do it with some liquid adult beverages. But thank you for everyone for being here. Your, your mic again, Ivana. Thank you. How does that work? Does that work? Okay. Okay. All right. I never know what's going to work on this and what is it. But thank you for getting us all together. I really appreciate your effort. And I miss you too. And the next time I see you, you're going to get a cold brewski from me, kid. For those of you who don't know, Ivana doesn't drink and, and uh, maybe once a year. And so that's a real honor to, to, to be able to share a, an adult drink, as uh, Kakali said, uh, with Ivana. So that would be, uh, I look forward to that. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming.